So a number of years ago on our mission trip when we were in Malawi visiting our sister church, Lingazi CCAP, in the long way, I was hanging out with one of our pastor friends, a pastor by the name of Biswick, who has been here before, and I went over to his house and we were chatting, and he said, hey, by the way, we're going to a wedding reception right now. And I was like, what? I thought, I thought we were just visiting. He's like, no, 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 no. There's a big wedding, and I'm not doing the wedding, but there's a reception, and we need to go. And I'm looking at myself, and I'm like... I mean, at least I was wearing like khakis and a polo shirt. I mean, I was like, okay, I I, I guess this is okay, but it seems kind of weird. So we we go to this wedding reception, and I mean, and it it is a wedding reception. There's probably 500 people there. It is outdoors. It is elaborate. It is like they do weddings right in Malawi. I will tell you this. And so I'm kind of just you know, and me, I'm like, well. I'm not really sure that I fit at this wedding. Like, I don't know anyone at this wedding besides Biswick. And then he grabs my hand, because this is the culture in Africa, and he walks me through a crowd of 400 people all the way to the very front of the wedding reception. Because that's where the abusas, or the pastors, sit. They are all gathered together at this wedding reception in the very front. Like, the bride and groom were literally right in front of me, and the parents were off to the side, And I am like, I have never crashed a wedding in my entire life. And it is very obvious that I am crashing a wedding. I don't quite look the part. I'm definitely not dressed for the part. And and I'm just sitting there thinking, what in the world is happening here? And and we're there for a little while. And then the parents of the bride and the parents of the groom stand up and make their way toward me. And I'm like, oh, Lord, have mercy. Mercy. Like, they're going to be like, why are you at our son and our daughter's wedding? You don't even know who they are. And so I'm sitting there anticipating what it is they are going to say to me. And then they spoke these gracious, welcoming, inviting words, saying, we are so glad that you've come all the way from the United States to come to the reception of our son and daughter. And I was like, "Uh uh uh-huh, 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 that's exactly what I did. (laughs) But it was just this, they call Malawi the warm heart of Africa. And, and there was just in their words, there was this expression of gratitude that I was there. And I'll never forget that, just the power of the spoken word of someone making their way toward me in order to greet me and to welcome me. And, you know, if you've been paying attention here the last several weeks, we've been kind of having conversations around that of a generous and gracious hospitality. But particularly for me, what I want to focus on is that word. Because the text we're going to read in just a moment from Hebrews chapter 1 really describes Jesus as the final word, the ultimate word. But that word is then expressed in three different sorts of roles. As Jesus lives his life out, as Jesus expresses himself through word and action, we see that being shown forth in the role of prophet, priest, and king. And so for the next seven weeks, that's what we do want to spend some time talking about, the role of Jesus as prophet, the role of Jesus as priest, and the role of Jesus as king, and how he fulfills those offices of the Old Testament. He fulfills them perfectly. F.F. Bruce, in his commentary on Hebrews, puts it like this, as he describes Jesus. He says, he is the prophet through whom God has spoken his final word. He is the priest who has accomplished a perfect work of cleansing for his people's sins. He is the king who sits enthroned in the place of chief honor alongside the majesty on high. And so as we read through our text this morning in Hebrews chapter 1, and we take a look at the first nine verses, you're going to hear those themes uh, being spoken of as the, the author of Hebrews writes these words. So let us listen now to Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the past, God spoke, notice spoke, so the word, spoke to our ancestors, to the prophets, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory 
and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things, and here you go, by his powerful word. So that prophetic word. After he had provided purification for sins, okay, so here's the priestly role, provided purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, and now here comes the kingly role. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. The role of prophet, priest, and king were also roles that were anointed. They were set apart, whether you were a prophet or a priest or a king. That anointing set you apart into that specific role. And so the preacher or the teacher of Hebrews speaks of Jesus Christ as the word, as the final, as the first, obviously, first word, the word that was there at the very beginning was creation was spoken into being, but he is also the final word the authoritative word over our lives. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, is the way the Gospel of John presents that. And so Jesus then, we want to think about in this kind of, this 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 word that he brings is kind of the focus for us this morning, and then we're going to delve more deeply into the, the specific roles of prophet, priest, and king. Jesus brings this word. He is the, the fulfillment of the word. And this season of Lent, what we are about in the next six weeks as we move our way, as we move toward Easter, is is preparing ourselves to be able to truly celebrate Easter, to to walk through the darkness, to walk through the difficult times with Jesus, so that when Easter morning arrives, we are able to do that. But the problem is we so quickly, I so quickly, I just want to jump to Easter, right? Like we don't want to deal with the darkness of Monday, Thursday and the darkness of Good Friday. And Jesus saying, let this cup pass from me. We see that every Holy Week, just simply based on worship attendance, right? Easter Sunday, we'll have four services. It'll be spectacular and it'll be marvelous. But something about Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday just doesn't seem to attract a large crowd. So guess what I'm going to do this morning? We're going to go to the cross, okay? So we're, we're, going, to, we're going to get dark very quick. But I want to share with you three words, three conversations that Jesus has from the cross, because in those words, even as Jesus is dying on the cross, he is still fulfilling the role of prophet, priest, and king. Not only in his earthly ministry, but also as he is dying on the cross. So we're just going to kind of parse through these really quick, but I want you to see the roles that Jesus is carrying out. The Gospel of Luke, the 23rd chapter, Luke 23, verse 34. Jesus, as he is dying on the cross, we are familiar. There are seven last words that Jesus speaks. We're going to look at three of those this morning. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Father, forgive them. This is the priestly role. The priest would offer the sacrifices to God, bringing forth the forgiveness of God. But Jesus now looks at a broken world and he looks at a broken people standing beneath him as he is hanging there on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive. They really don't know what they have done. They really don't know what they are doing. And that gift of forgiveness brings about the possibility of reconciliation. 
that we as humans find ourselves separated from God. There is this distance, there is this chasm, there is this brokenness and of which that separates us from God's love. And Jesus in the dying on the cross as ulti- as, as, as he sacrifices his life, he brings about this forgiveness that he can not only proclaim father, forgive them, he can forgive. Remember, this is what upset the religious teachers so much that Jesus would say, I forgive your sins. And they're like, no one gets to forgive sins except for God. And Jesus, in the last moments of his life, looks out on this crowd, looks out on people like you and me, and says, Father, forgive them. Be reconciled to them. The Apostle Paul writing in Colossians talks about how we were once alienated from God, but because of Jesus Christ, we have been reconciled. This forgiveness brings life. This forgiveness brings hope in the midst of a broken world. So we have a priestly word. Now I want to talk about a prophetic word because a prophetic word calls us to action. This is also spoken by Jesus on the cross. This is in John chapter 19, verse 25. It says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. So the prophetic word, you think about the prophets, their calling and their task, as Scott alluded to in his prayer, was to call the people of Israel back to task. And sometimes they were scattered and sometimes they were wild. And even in Hebrews, it says in kind of this, you know, that they were, they, they spoke here and there was times there and there was silence here and, and all this sort of stuff. But Jesus now looks at the disciple whom we assume is John and he says, look, you have a task. You have a calling. I am, I am prophesying and I am saying, speaking these words to you of what I'm going to call you into, which is to care for my mom. Obviously, none of Jesus' siblings or half-siblings were there. And so he looks at John, he says, this is your calling. This is your mission. This is your ministry. Apart from everything else that you're going to be doing, take care of her. And so you see the word of God, the calling of Jesus, the voice of Jesus from the cross is not only a forgiving word, it is a calling to us to saying, look, you don't just sit there. There is work to be done. There are widows to be cared for. There is a ministry and mission to be carried out. And it's work that we might not always do or think about. And yet Jesus calls John into that. So there is a word of forgiveness. There is a word of calling. And then in John chapter 19, verse 30, there is this final word. When Jesus had received the drink, he said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. And because it was finished, and because he had followed the plan that God had along, we know that in three days later, he would be raised from the dead. He would find himself seated at the right-hand side of God the Father, as Hebrews talks about and as other places talk about. He would find that role of fulfillment. He would bring, bring, be the king who brought his kingdom. Remember, when Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom, it was not always a future tense thing. Obviously, it is a future tense thing. But he would say, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. He had this kingly role, but he had to finish his earthly task. And so that's why, and in a, in a part of this, and I want to just spend just a, mi- a minute on this, because oftentimes I will have people come up to me when we have communion and we do the Apostles' Creed, and they will ask, what does descended into hell mean? And I would say, I'll say, there's some great theologians out there, let me refer you to reading them, Right? And I was just having this conversation with someone the other day, and they're like, you know, was he really in hell? And they're asking all these sorts of questions, and they're good questions, and they're, you know, they're. It's not always simple, like trying to sort that out. But but when I read that, and I'm like, he, you know, he descended into hell. Like, what is that saying? It's saying that his earthly task was done, but there was still something else left to be done, and that was that he had he had to experience 
this separation from the Father, this eternal love that he had with the Father, this eternal relationship that he had with the Father, he had to take, he had to take that separation on and he had to be separated from God because that's what we deserve. Like, what is hell? Well, in my mind, when I think about what hell is, it, 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 it is the absence of God. It is the absence of any relationship with God. It is the absence of the Imago Dei. It, it is all this sort of stuff. And Christ has to endure all of that, knowing somehow deep down, because he is Jesus and he knows these things, that all will be well and all will be worked out. But he experiences that so that he might be seated at the right-hand side of the Father, so that he might be King of kings and Lord of lords, so that he might be raised from the dead, and we might then live into that truth and that reality and that wonder of what God has done for us. He finishes the task. He assumes the throne. Not an earthly throne, but a heavenly throne. He brings the kingdom. And even on the cross, he is fulfilling those roles of prophet, priest, and king. And this is all beautiful, and this is all wonderful. And Hebrews chapter 1 is this incredible exposition of the high Christology of Jesus Christ and what it is that Christ has accomplished and the mediation that he brings and the forgiveness that he offers and the throne that he sits upon and how he is the final word. And then the preacher has the audacity to say something in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, that should serve as a wake-up call to all of us. He writes this, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not what? Drift. Oh, y'all were very quiet there. Drift away. You know, th- this is what preachers do, right? Like we're like, we have these high moments. We're like, and this is great. And this is wonderful. And do you see God's glory? And do you see what Christ has done? And do you see the new life that you can have? And do you see the opportunity that is before you to serve and to be a forgiving person and to love others just as you have been loved? And then there's the warning, right? But be very careful. Because you and I as humankind and as humanity have a problem. We tend to drift. There's mission drift. There's faith drift. We just drift. Every now and then someone will get super angry or super upset with God or super upset with the church and they will just walk away. That happens. But more often than not, the issue is drift. Y'all probably experienced this when you were younger. And if you used to, you know, I, I grew up in the Central Valley. I didn't go to the ocean very often, but man, I would go to the ocean and, and we'd start swimming and, and, and I'd look out after like 20 or 30 minutes of being out in the water and looking up and I'm like, where the heck is my stuff? Like y'all ever have this point? And you're like, and you look around at the, and you're like, how in the world am I 50 feet away from where I went into the water? Right. It's some, Maybe I'm the only person that ever experienced this, right? But you know, there, there, there's like these channels and there's these, these waters that are just kind of pushing you either one way or the other way. And all of a sudden you look around and you're like, I, I'm, I don't, I don't know where my stuff is. And this is the problem with our faith. It's not like this great catastrophic storm. I mean, that stuff happens, but typically it is just a little drift and a little bit more and a little bit more. And all of a sudden we look up and we're like, where the heck is Jesus? Well, he hasn't moved, but you have. And so the preacher of Hebrews says, be very careful. So I want to end with one more text. And this is kind of, um, it's a text that has been troubling me for a while. And I'm not quite sure exactly why it's troubling me. Well, actually, I think I do know why it's troubling me. Um, but when I'm troubled by a text, I just like to share them with all of you. So you might be troubled as well. How's that? Isn't that great? I got the stage. I got the microphone. I got the Bible. So, um, and, and, and I heard this a while and, and I, don't, I don't even know who I was listening to or what it was, but it was just this sense about, are, are you aware of what it is that God is about in your life? Are you, are you paying attention to these things? Because God moves in mysterious ways. So we're going to look at the book of Numbers, um, the ninth chapter, and just five or six verses there, where 
we, we see, um, we, we, it's actually a story of the radiance of God. It's the, it, it's the glory of God. It's the, 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 the tabernacle that is then, um, has a cloud of fire. You remember this is how God led the people and this cloud would rest upon the tabernacle. And, and then there's this story. This is uh, Hebrews chapter nine, verse 17. And it says this. So whenever the cloud, the glory, this is the glory of God, the, the, the radiant glory of God. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out, and wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. So, the, so that glory, that, that's the presence of God, that, that, that glory that we're talking about. That's the, that's the Holy Spirit in our lives. Like if we're trying to think through like kind of what does that look like? Wherever it settled, the Israelites encamped. Verse 18. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the camp, as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp, and then at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Here's what's troubling to me about this text. If the people of Israel are on a journey... I would like to think it's a linear journey that makes sense. As in, hike all day, spend the night, get up the next morning, hike some more, spend the night, get up the next morning, hike some more. On the Sabbath, maybe you rest. The book of Numbers says that's not how God works. Sometimes they rested for one night. Sometimes they camped for months. Sometimes the glory of God said, you'll be here a couple of days. But the question was, would they be obedient? Would they follow the glory of God? Were they paying attention? Because I have a tendency, as I have expressed this before, to say to God, Here is a great plan, God, and now I would like for you to bless it. Here is my journey. Here is my triptych. Here is my GPS. Here's whatever it is. And this is the path I have figured out. And God laughs, right, as God is really good at doing. And God says, no. I've got to teach you some things. And sometimes you just need to be still. Because there are some things you need to learn. And sometimes you need to get moving and quit being still. Because you've been sitting too long. But the question is, are we paying attention to the one who calls himself prophet, priest, and king? Are we seeking to map out our own agenda? our own schedule, our own life, doing what we think makes the most sense? Or are we trusting God? So as we wrap up, have you drifted recently? As you think about your faith, has there been a little drift? The season of Lent is a great time to kind of refocus our lives. Or maybe you've just been mapping out your life without really including God in the conversation and seeking what it is that God might be trying to say to you. Perhaps this season of Lent, we need to reorient our lives, to look to the one who is the prophet priest, and king, to look for his glory, to listen for his voice, and seek to be faithful to the God who forgives us and the God who gives us life and hope. Pray with me, please. God, for this day, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that we awaken to a new morning where your mercies are new. And God, you have already been at work in this day, and we simply get to wake up and be a part of it. 
We recognize our tendency to drift. We recognize our tendency to be pulled away. We recognize our tendency to often try and control things and not look for you. Forgive us, Lord. That is the greatest word spoken over us. Father, forgive them. Because that is a word of reconciliation. It is a word that makes us right with you, O Lord. So let us live with that confidence of knowing that we, though once alienated, have been reconciled through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We are made whole, and we are grateful. We ask and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.